Hi, everyone, and welcome to January 16th, 4D and Wakanda user group meeting. Uh, today at the meeting, we're going to hear again a little bit about 4D method, what we do here. Um, we'll get the 4D news from Jim and Donna in San Jose. Uh, we'll have the 4D iNug E Digest from Ed Hammond, not the Ed Digest or the, the E. Yeah, no, that's it's the E Digest. Um, and we'll get a, uh, a section I like to call What the Blog, uh, where I cover a few things that are um, uh, a few of the blog articles, the 4D blog articles that have come out recently. I'll talk a little bit about what's to know in the knowledge base, covering a few uh, recent articles in the knowledge base. And then we'll have our special topic presentation, uh, Kentika and API for Efficient Electronic Document Management in 4D from Alexander Bernard, or shall I say, Dr. Alexander Bernard, one of our first doctors on the uh, in the meeting tier to present. So welcome. Uh, we'll have general questions and answers, and we'll talk about the next meeting. Um, so uh, my name is Brent Raymond, and uh, I organize the 4D in Wakanda user group. Our website is at 4dmethod.com, and uh, we can be reached at 4dmethod at gmail.com. Uh, what we do here is we're trying to bring together a scattered community community of developers and users of 4D and Wakanda. Uh, in Wakanda and 4D applications, users of the applications as well. Uh, we stream all the meetings via YouTube Live to allow people to participate from anywhere. All of the meetings, uh, today's included, are recorded and uh, all as well as all the feature presentations. Uh, to be viewed again at later dates or shared with others, including uh, customers or potential customers. Um, our, our goal here is to provide fresh new content uh, all throughout the year uh, and exposure for users and developers of 4D and Wakanda products everywhere in the world. Um, so, right, I just uh, thought I'd uh, start off the meeting by wishing everybody a happy new year, happy 2019 with, uh, with some Orta fireworks. Um, it's uh, it's uh, going to be a great year. A lot of things already uh, happening uh, and coming out with 4D. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, happy holidays to everybody. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining 4D uh, this January for the, uh, for the 4D Method group presentation. Um, so right, so kicking it over to Jim and Donna to talk a little bit about uh, the news from 4D and, and what's happening this year with 4D. Hi, Brent. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to um, viewers here from 4D Incorporated in San Jose. Um, as always, our thanks to Brent and Ed for organizing these 4D method meetings. I know it takes a lot of time. Um, we, we appreciate you inviting 4D to participate. And uh, yeah, we enjoy the, the demonstrations as much as anyone else. So thanks for doing that. Uh, we're looking forward to Alexander's presentation on Kentika today. Uh, electronic management, document management, of course, is a, a rapidly growing industry. Um, I know here in the Silicon Valley in particular, they have a great solution that um, I got to see a few weeks ago and was very impressed. And I think that our 4D developers will be interested in it as well. Um, I think that they have something like 2,000 installations right now in, in Europe and in Canada. So uh, they're successful and growing. Um, so uh, here at 4D, we're wrapping up our end of year uh, accounting and sales. We had another very successful year uh, globally and locally as well. So we surpassed the revenue from 2017, uh, which was in itself one of our best years ever. So we're really happy to keep building on that and growing um, every year. So thank you all, uh, 4D developers out there, for for your business, for your trust in 4D. Um, we really appreciate that, and especially those of you who took advantage of the Amazon uh, gift promotion this year. It was our most successful ever, and it, it seems like people just keep uh, waiting till the end of the year for particularly large sales. So we're happy to to continue to run that, and um, it's a really successful campaign for us. So thank you all. Uh, going back to our, our annual um, uh, revenue, uh, professional services continues to be a growing part of our revenue stream. 
Uh, we've developed our professional services team a good deal of trust with uh, 40 developers all over the world, really, who have come to rely on us for code reviews or uh, database migration or web development, whatever, much more. And as I've said many times before, the most successful professional services projects that I work on are those where we work closely with the 40 developer who owns the application or who has developed the application. Those are the ones that are um, really successful for us and the most interesting. So we are here to help 40 developers um, help their their customers, uh, whether it be web development or whatever. So uh, thank you for uh, building that trust. And finally, as Donna will discuss in, in her portion right after me, uh, we're also getting super busy now for a World Tour 2019, which is only 11, 11 weeks away now. Uh, it starts in April and then we'll continue on into May. We'll be visiting our, our favorite cities like Chicago, where hopefully it'll be a little warmer than it is now. Uh, and uh, Boston, Seattle, and San Jose, those are where we usually go every year or every two years. And then we, we're adding uh, Austin and Atlanta this year. So, of course, our, our good friend JPR, John Pierre Ribro, will be doing the training for us on day two, along with Ad Coleman Chair Rensory. Uh, so, hopefully, you guys will mark your calendars early and uh, be able to join us at one of the cities where we're, we're coming to you in your backyard. So, uh, Donna, that said, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, thank you, Jim. Okay, you're you're welcome, you, everyone. Thank you, Brent, for having me. I always love these meetings. Yeah, of course. Thank so you for as, joining. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you very much. So as uh, Jim had mentioned, we're getting ready for a world tour. I personally am very excited about this. Um, it's the first world tour that I've gotten to plan for 4D. So um, I've been really busy with this. And I'm just going to give you just give you a brief um, Rundown. So we have um, obviously two days, as Jim said, two days in each city. And the first round of cities, which is considered our eastern swing, we will be going to Chicago. And the dates are going to be April 1st and 2nd for that event. And that is going to be in Schaumburg at the Doubletree. Then we go on to Boston, and that will be in Wakefield at the Sheraton. Those dates are April 4th and 5th. And Atlanta, finishing up the Eastern at Atlanta at the Ellis Hotel, which is a beautiful property that is um, right there in the middle of the downtown Atlanta on Peachtree, which is their biggest, um, that's like their main street there. And so um, it's near the Coca-Cola factory. So if anybody's near that area and has a chance to get to the World Tour, I definitely would recommend it. It's going to be really um, a lot of fun, a lot of great things happening. The dates for um, the Atlanta sessions are 8th and 9th. The, it is a two-day event. The first day is going to be the latest and greatest in 4D. The guest speakers, as Jim mentioned, we will be talking about Orta, 4D for iOS, a lot of great stuff. So I really, really, really hope that all of you guys can make it and tell your friends, coworkers. It's going to be really um, just awesome. And then the second day is um, just really targeting training session all day training and it is going to be a little bit more for um, structured for advanced intermediate however we always welcome everybody to join if they can do both days that's even better and that is um, going to be <clears throat> excuse me um, that is going to cover Orta um, and all of the newer features that um, and things that we want to um, you know let everyone get more information on and, um, and learn how to um, you know incorporate into their building of applications. When we come back from that eastern swing, then there will be a, about a two to three week break. And of course, as we get closer, I'll be announcing these, um, these um, actual dates. Um, but we are going to be going to Austin, Seattle, and San Jose, as Jim said. And um, if anyone has any information or would like any information, you can either find that on our website or call, feel free to call me or Jim or email um, your sales, um, 40 sales representative and all of this information will be ready to go next week as far as the website. So um, I'd like to again, invite everyone. I think it's gonna be really awesome and I hope you all can meet, make it. Thank you very much. Thanks, back to you Brent. Okay, thanks, Donna. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, those um, those world tours are uh, are really invaluable now that um, that the summit conferences are a little bit further spaced 
out and as fast as the language is, uh, is, is changing and, and new capabilities are being added to the language. Uh, it's really great to, uh, to, to, to get in there and, and see what's going on and, and have it presented by JPR and, and add and some of these uh, very uh, skilled, uh, some of the most skilled developers in the 4D community. So uh, thanks again, guys. Thank you. Um, and speaking of, uh, of new stuff being released with, uh, with 4D, uh, 4D V17 R3 just dropped yesterday. Woo! Um, that includes uh, 40, uh, new features for 4D for iOS, including data formatters, the ability to create your own list and detail form templates, uh, adding your own icons. Uh, all of that is, um, is a big step in the direction of customizing the, the iOS applications that are being able to be generated directly out of your 4D application. Uh, more advances for 4D Write Pro, including uh, new attributes for controlling uh, uh, windows and orphans and page breaks, and uh, the, the ability to, to code, uh, create headers and footers uh, directly from the language. Um, more stuff with page layout and managing sections. Uh, just really, there's a, there's a torrent of new features coming out all the time with uh, 4D Write Pro. Not only that, uh, but there's more uh, in, in R3, we get uh, more thread safe commands. If you're not moving your code to, uh, to preemptive and thread safe uh, language and, and operation, man, you really should be. It has a, a, a tremendous uh, difference uh, and impact on the uh, performance of your application. Um, but in this version, we get more of the, we get the blob commands, uh, commands for encryption and picture handling and, and localization features. Uh, and in R3, uh, the, for as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the, uh, the elephant in the room, one of the elephants in the room anyways, um, the ability to create your own formula objects. This is a, uh, a monumental addition and change to the, uh, the 4D language. Um, it's really, you know, when I started thinking about it, uh, it uh, kind of made my head spin what, what you could do with this uh, as far as uh, taking a different architectural approach to, to your application. Uh, there's a little snippet right there in the window, uh, but you're able to store these formulas in objects and refer to object, other object properties by way of uh, this. Uh, and um, and basically run that formula as a method, a member method for that object. Big step in the direction of sort of a class class based uh, uh, programming approach within 4D. Uh, just again makes my head spin what you can do with this. So it'll be exciting to see what people do do with it. Um, and onward, uh, the ability to export the structure file in plain text, uh, which is uh, very useful. Again, a step in the direction of version control. Um, exporting a classic 4D form to a dynamic form. Uh, that's easing, easing the transition to uh, uh, moving your, your forms into being uh, uh, more dynamic and code controlled uh, and generated on the fly. Um, and then also uh, the ability to get info about the running application into a big object or collection of information. Whew, a lot coming out in R3. Um, and there's a lot being talked about in the iNUG. So I'll hand it over now to Ed Hammond, our own Ed Hammond here at the, the Art Institute of Chicago. Happy to have him uh, to talk about some of the discussion on the iNUG. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Brent. As always, uh, the iNUG, uh, if you're not familiar with it, you should be. Uh, there's a wide breadth of topics uh, being discussed on the iNUG and a wealth of experience from uh, uh, ex uh, longtime 4D programmers. Um, you should check out uh, the list. Uh, I highlight uh, some of the threads uh, every time we do a, a, a 4D method meeting here online. And those links are posted on 4D Method eDigest. So without further ado, um, 
since our last meeting. Kirk Brooks has been really active, and he started out by uh, uh, announcing he's updated his side Orta example database uh, from his 40 method presentation back in September. If you haven't looked at this, uh, side Orta is basically all of the example code from the documentation. Uh, so each command, you can see how they operate and step through a, a few lines. Uh, very helpful as you're getting uh, uh, familiar with Orta. Uh, he also uh, uh, had a post of be, uh, with advice of be willing to be a beginner with Orta, liking it to learning a whole new language, which really it is. If you're uh, have been around the 4D community for a long time, you're going to be doing things a lot differently going forward as you use the power of Orta. So open your mind, take a look at a few examples inside Orta, and uh, uh, progress. Uh, I think you'll like what you see. Um, we had Neil Schaefer, who was looking for uh, Windows Server hardware recommendations for 40 Server v17 applications. Uh, pretty much the title says it all there. Uh, many I Nug members that are running Windows Server hardware had lots of lots of suggestions, some with uh, very specific processor recommendations. But uh, you know, uh, most people uh, just have the line that more is better. Um, although uh, there have been uh, uh, at least one uh, response to that that says. Well, if you've been running 40 Info Reporter, you'll know whether or not your current implementation satisfies uh, what your needs are. So uh, there's a, a good plug there for the 40 Info Reporter. And if you're not running it, you should be. Uh, Cannon Smith was asking questions about Mojave and uh, if there are Mac OS considerations and expected problems going forward, I can probably speak for Brent in saying there's a few little quirks. He uh, continues to, to go forward while I remain back behind and satisfy the bulk of our user base at this point. Uh, and we're constantly testing things out. Um, also, uh, Armin Deeg had a warning about 4D, Mojave, and full disk access. Apparently, there's some changes to uh, Mac OS. You have to uh, give some permissions to uh, uh, the user to have full access for Mojave. Um, check out his thread if you want to know more specifics. Uh, Brad Olson uh, was looking for uh, using native 4D to make REST requests to a Django application. Uh, Django is a Python-based uh, uh, model view controller framework for web applications, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Django. But he was asking for help in how to make native HTTP requests to, the, to any sort of REST API, uh, and specifically help with HTTP HTTP authenticate uh, to get a token. Uh, and he got some good advice on that thread. Uh, Tom Benedict opened the proverbial can of worms that is always there when you ask coding slash development style guide, question uh, mark. Lots of people uh, have opinions, but anytime you uh, have a coding or development style debate, you're going to have lots of responses. Uh, my own personal observation is for a team, they all work as long as they're agreed upon and consistently applied. So work with your team to come up with uh, what works for you. Uh, Kirk Brooks uh, posted a couple of tips, and he likes, likes to uh, preface his uh, subject with tip when he's got it. Uh, one of them is an esoteric method for calculating Excel column references. Uh, if you need it, look it up. The code is included. Uh, Randy Angle was looking for a list box help for assigning a pull-down array, a la AL, uh, 
Aerialist Pro for data entry. And who should come to the rescue but Kirk Brooks, who delivered a uh, pre-collection type list box uh, solution. Um, and then finally, Kirk had a tip for hiding rows of a collection-based list box in parentheses. You can't, and that's okay. Uh, collection-based list boxes are different than array-based. And uh, specifically in this case, there's no hidden array. So he came up with a solution for uh, doing some user interface techniques that he had used hidden arrays for. Uh, last and not least, a Aerialist Pro uh, version 10.1 was released, and there's a link uh, to that uh, announcement on the iNug on my page. So uh, check out the, uh, the links on the eDigest page, and uh, I'll pass it back to you, Brent. Thanks, Ed. Um, just uh, we had a quick question from Mike Betty on the... Uh in the chat room here. Um, oh, never mind. He found it, but he was asking about uh, who posted regarding the REST authentication methods. Um, and again, all the uh, synopsis of, of the conversations that Ed mentioned are on his page on the uh, 40 method website. Um, and Ed, uh, I guess uh, we'll get an answer for that in the uh, chat. Uh, Brad Olson, right. Um, yeah, so thanks, Ed, for, uh, for compiling uh, a list of uh, a digest uh, of, of all the conversation that's happening out there. Uh, it's a lot to keep up with for us if we're not uh, reading it uh, on a constant basis. Um, but there's just uh, great information out there, people sharing uh, the same issues that, uh, that you might be facing. Um, and uh, thanks again uh, to Kirk Brooks for being so active on the NUG and making his uh, side order, updating his side order database for everybody to, uh, to sort of uh, get a good feel for how to, how to experiment with, with Orda and how to use each of the member functions. Um, if you haven't checked out Kirk's uh, 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 presentation to 4D Method, uh, where he uh, first showed off side order and his uh, and, and his recent work that he was uh, was presenting, uh, definitely check it out. It's a good starting place for dipping your toe into using Orda, and and to see what it can do for you for you. All right. So uh, onward to what the blog. So recently, and these are just, uh, again, uh, just a few of the, the articles that I'd like to highlight. Uh, but there is a, a interesting little article recently uh, about uh, um, integrating Bootstrap into uh, 4D using 4D transformation tags along with Bootstrap to uh, style your pages either in 4D web areas or uh, in, in publishing directly from 4D to the web. Uh, pretty cool, I mean, so many web developers are familiar with Bootstrap and it makes uh, styling your interfaces really nice and easy, uh, especially when you combine that with uh, 4D tags, which are very powerful. Um, and there's a uh, blog article about a component to export the structure file, which gives you a little handy dandy uh, interface for choosing what gets exported. Uh, including the project methods, forms, uh, folders, and the menus, all of that kind of stuff. So you can uh, set it up for yourself, save those settings, and uh, perhaps on a regular basis export the uh, the structure and and you know the structure for those of us who aren't familiar entirely with what's in the structure. Well, it's it's everything but the data. So it includes the the uh, menu definition, form definition, all of the code, all of the code that's buried in the forms if, if that's the way your application is written. So it's a great way to, uh, to archive and to uh, uh, track the uh, version control with your application uh, by exporting the structure file. Um, we get the fourth and final installation of a review of the compatibility settings from uh, Tomas Mao. Uh, that is a, a great series. Uh, I have 
updated the compatibility settings with our application here at the museum in, in reaction to uh, his content in, the, in, that, in those articles. Uh, and in fact, it's just uh, it's interesting to, to get a little bit of an idea of the history of where the compatibility settings came from. Um, what was the behavior that uh, that it's that you are uh, perhaps uh, persisting in these compatibility settings, and perhaps you shouldn't be uh, enabling those. You should be disabling them or enabling them one way or the other uh, moving forward. And you could have just with a checkbox uh, a, some considerable performance bumps. Um, so definitely check out that series for any of us developers. Uh, it's a, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of applications that have been around for several years and, uh, and probably have, uh, it's worth, worth reviewing those settings. And then I just wanted to highlight a, a little bit of an older article. I think it was from October of last year, but you know, this is uh, uh, just a great fe feature of 4D View Pro, uh, namely an R3, 17 R3, that you're able to construct uh, Excel documents and, and you know, the, the fancy version, XLSX, uh, using 4D View Pro. So, so many of us um, having, having a, you know, 4D manage uh, all kinds of our business data and and data in general uh, are tasked with creation of Excel files and integration via Excel and, and some of the Microsoft suite of applications. Um, so this this makes it uh, very easy, especially uh, it, as you can take advantage of some of the other interface features that are are made available with 4D View Pro to uh, enrich your interface. Um, so, right, so check out the blog. Again, great material in there, great write-ups, sample databases in each of the articles, uh, pretty pictures. Uh, it's, it's got everything you want. <laughs> so, uh, also, uh, our, uh, the, the 4D knowledge base, one of my favorites, it's uh, just got years, you know, the 4D blog is, I believe it started last year or something like that. Um, the knowledge base goes back years and, and has so many different tiny little tips, you know, some of them tips, some of them lengthier tech notes with white papers and sample databases. Um, a few of the, uh, the ones that, that stood out to me more recently, uh, remember to check the power plan used on your 4D server machine. Specifically, this is in Windows machines. Um, you can set it to max power. You could even change the name of your server to Max Power and sing the Homer Simpson song. Ed, you ready? Start away. No, no, you were, you're, you were gonna sing that one. No, Max Power, he's the man. No, I'm not gonna do it, but uh, that's that's all you get. I'll uh, I'll respond to a YouTube comments if necessary on that one. So I'm, I apologize in advance. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that's that's a good tip. Check your settings for power, uh, so you can unleash the uh, the full amount of your full capacity of your server for the application. Um, also, a, a a very nice article on and review on 4D record locking and ORDA uh, entity locking. So you know, in 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 traditional 4D, you know, it's records and in ORDA they're referred to as entities. However, uh, traditionally, it's just basic record locking, uh, and they're handled a little bit differently. And, and Eric reviews the difference between uh, the old type of 4D programming and, and ORDA and different uh, approaches you can take to record locking. Um, some of those features are still being developed uh, and, and being uh, optimized for uh, uh, new versions of 4D. Um, so it's great to keep up to date with how to handle that because if you're uh, handling a, a lot of data, many different users in your application, it, I mean, you've got to handle record locking. So also another uh, article, another tech note called Power Your Orta Queries with Query Options. Again, another article that focuses on the, the different approaches between the old uh, 4D search language queries and, and whatnot, 
and what can be done now with Orta and, and, and advantages of using Orta in many uh, uh, instances, if, if for no other reason than to make the code easier on your eyes. Yeah, it's all tends to be in one line. You can combine that with uh, the data retrieval and, uh, and some, uh, some of the fancier language uh, options with collections and the member functions of collections. So great article from uh, Jiang Lu. Uh, thanks so much to, uh, to 4D for, for offering these uh, knowledge base articles and tech tips uh, and, uh, and to, to help, help us all learn how to uh, code 4D a little bit a little bit better, a little bit uh, uh, a little bit more organized. So on to the special topic. Uh, we have Alexander Bernard, Dr. Alexander Bernard joining us from, Lyon, France. He um, he's a uh, a doctor of inorganic chemistry, but we're not going to discuss that today. Thankfully, uh, I have not. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that would. Uh, I'm I'm more comfortable in 4D coding than uh, than chemistry. Ooh, making me shiver. Um, he's a, a research and design engineer at Kentika. Uh, Kentika is the publisher of the Kentika. Atomic Software, a leading solution for documentation centers. It's used, as Jim mentioned, uh, by over 350 clients in France and deployed in other large and small businesses worldwide. Uh, the software is written in 4D and has been developed since 1987. Uh, it's used in more than 30 countries and multiple different languages. Uh, it's used for electronic data management, or sort of uh, DAMs, as, as is commonly referred to. Um, they recently decided to develop an API for, for managing files uh, and um, to access their research engine for searching files via their content and description metadata. Uh, Alexander is responsible for the development of the said atomic portal. Woo! and project management and support. Uh, he's here to show us today a bit of how to use their API to integrate with Kentika from potentially your own 4D systems. So that's gonna be a, a, a huge uh, uh, step ahead for any of our applications to be able to integrate the features made available by Kentika. So welcome, Alexander. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Brent. Yes. Uh, thank you for the great uh, introduction. So um, I'm going to try, try to speak slow enough um, so my French accent doesn't get too much in the way. Let me know if, uh, if it gets uh, really bad. No, so yeah. <laughs> to begin with, uh, like you said and like Jim said earlier, um, electronic document management, or, or EDM, is getting really big right now. Um, lots of people used to deal with electronic documents um, that needs to be shared by putting a shared drive on the network and then added documents to that. But after a couple of years, um, this gets really difficult to use. Um, it's easy to add documents to there, but then when you need to find them, it's really difficult. You've got the same documents all over the place. So this, this is not a good solution. So a lot of people are actually turning to an actual software to do that work for them. And we have, we, like you said, we develop a, a software that does that. And a lot of people who are using our software uh, came to us and say, hey, we have our own business software that deals with documents. So how can we interact with your, with your software to make the, the to, to deal with those, those documents easily? So that's why we actually, like you said, developed the API. So what I'm going to show today, um, I'm going to show you this API. And so you understand what the features are. I'm going to show you our application as well. Um, so if I go and share my screen. All right. OK. Um, is, that, is that fine? Uh, there's not much to see on my screen right now. Uh, let's see. Yep, we got it now. Yep, and I'll, uh, I'll shift okay, over perfect. the presentation to you. Yep. Perfect, thank you. So um, to begin with, actually, and to talk a bit about us, I'm going to start with the uh, um, PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about us and the company, Kentika. I'm going to talk then about the software and, and let you know how the ar architecture works. 
really quickly. I'm not going to go into too much details. Then I'm going to talk about EDM and what are the basic uh, functions that are expected in an, e in, a, in an EDM software. And then I'll show you the interface. Um, to be able to show you the features of, the, of our software, it's a lot more pleasing to the eyes to see the, it's on, a, on the user interface than just the API, which is basically just JSON code. But then in the end, I'll show you what the, uh, what the API does. So about us, you already said much of this, but uh, I'll, I'll say it again. So we started in 1987. Uh, that was 4D uh, version 3. We've been doing electronic document management since uh, 1990. And we have uh, our application uh, publish a web portal since 1995. And that's since 1995, we've been working with only the 4D uh, web server. Some of our big customers that you guys uh, might know in the, in the US. Uh, so we have a, a big application at the Department of Justice in Canada, where there's basically uh, more than 1,000 lawyers uh, using Kentica to uh, deal with that documents. There's, they have like more than 300,000 documents, and the application has received a couple of awards from the, from the government of Canada. We also had a big case that's kind of a, a, an example that we like to, to cite because there wasn't for a class action. Um, again, lawyers. Uh, they use Kentica and the search uh, capabilities of, of Kentica to basically find uh, relevant information in the 25 millions of pages that the tobacco companies gave them uh, following this, this class action. And then there's a couple other names that maybe we'll, uh, we'll tell you who we work with. For the software now, so Kentica is 4D. Uh, it's a compiled 4D application. It runs usually as a local service. Um, this is quite important when we deal with documents because that means if you deal with the document as a, inside on your own servers, your documents stay in-house. So you don't give them on the cloud and they don't go somewhere you have no control over. The, we use the 4D client uh, mostly for a configuration purpose. Most of the day-to-day -day usage is actually done on the web. Um, we actually like to uh, refer to our, our, our software as a website builder because, like I said, it's all made with 4D, but the website is fully customizable so that um, depending on what options you want, depending on what uh, features you want, and also depending on what look you want. So we have uh, spent quite a lot of time to make it so that we can customize uh, the website easily and still keep it easy to update and give new versions to our customers. So, so we can Right now we have like, I'll show you if you have time, a couple of different examples. And most of them are just uh, basically the generic uh, data that we use, the generic pages that we use with options to customize them. Some of the key features about our uh, software. So um, the data structure is a bit spatial. It's not just the 4D uh, uh, tables. We don't access the 4D tables directly. We have a, like a, an extra layer on top so that we can actually have an open dictionary which means our users can add fields into their database, but they're not actually added to the 4D database. That means, that means, again, it's easy to update the application because the structure doesn't change. Um, we have pretty strong uh, authorization rules. This is both to access the different tools that are available and the data. So that means, I'll, I'll show you a little bit, some, some examples later on, but if you have very specific rules um, for who can access your documents, we can uh, customize them uh, to answer your needs. And then obviously for a, an EDM, you need a pretty, uh, pretty solid uh, search engine and we've got that as well. A little bit about the architecture. Um, so in the center, you have Kentica, which is the 4D application. Uh, you can connect to this at, with the 4D client, like I said, or with the browser. Um, we've got a bunch of other things we can interact with like RSS, email, uh, LDAP, we can use Dropbox, we can use a lot of, connect to another, lots of other applications. Um, for what we want to talk about here today, I'm just, just concentrate on these three blocks because this is what we're gonna be talking basically. So once again, I'll get back to that a bit later on, I think, because it's gonna be easier to understand once I've gone over the features. The features. So in the standard, we have, you have Kentica, the software based on 4D. Um, we also have, a Kentica document engine. So this is actually a, another service which was not developed with 4D. So all the Kentica is 4D. The Kentica document engine is not 4D. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what they do later on. And then we get basically your application. 
potentially. If you want to interact with them, you can interact either directly with Kentika or with the Kentika document engine, depending on what functionalities you need. And all these are basically REST API. So you're just communicating in JSON, which now that 40 has the, uh, the object uh, notation, makes it a lot easier. Let's talk a little bit about EGM now. So these are some of the basic features that an EGM needs to have. Um, first of all, you need to be able to store any type of document. This is not, not doing anything on them, but basically if you want to send a zip file or even your own internal uh, file, system, file type, we can just store it in the, data, in the database. And then some of the file types, you need to be able to do some extra stuff on them, like images, for example. Um, images, you need to be able to get the metadata. You need to be able to uh, extract a preview because you don't want to uh, give an, an extra large image to uh, your users every time. Um, if you talk about image, there's also the PDF, which can be images. Like, for example, if you're scanning uh, invoices, there's not going to be any actual text in them. It's just an image. So you need to be able to do OCR, which is optical character recognition, so that you can actually search into these files. For all the office, so all the like text-based files, like uh, Office files, PDF, emails, you need, able to be, you need to be able to extract that text if you want to work on it. Uh, you need to be able to convert it to other format, and that way you can present it to your users easily. And then you need to have a pretty solid uh, full text indexed so that you can actually uh, do um, some very good search on, on them. And the search needs to be as, as well on the full text, so on, on the contents of your files, and as well on the metadata. So you need to be able to search into both of them. And at the same time, you can also, it's better if you can use like some um, pretty specific operators. Like, for example, if you want to look, search for all the uh, words method, which is within three words of the word 4D, it's uh, even better. So I'm going to move on now and show you um, our application, basically. So as I said, uh, this is all web-based. So I'm going to show you the portal. So when you connect to the database, this is what you have. Um, this is your home page. One of the things that you'll notice here, you have this is, can be customized for every user. Once they're logged in, uh, they get the, the information that concerns them. So they can see their documents. They can see what's in the base. And this is all customizable as well. Um, when you go to, to see a list of documents, so on the left here, you can see in this, in this database that we've set up for, for this, um, we have an organization in Teams folders. I'm not going to go into too many details in there, but basically, if I want to see all the documents starting the Kentika team, I'm going to get into my list. Um, I've got like three different documents. Uh, two of them are, are the, the Lorem Ipsum documents, the PDF, the doc uh, is a, a doc file, a Microsoft Office file. Uh, if I go into the file, obviously, I'm going to be able to see the file in the page like this. Um, I'm going to have different options, like I can send it to, by, by email to another person. I can change the file. I can lock it. I can uh, do versioning, replace the file. Lots of options, like basic options. Um, and then if you go to modify, you can see the metadata on the file. So you can here again change the metadata. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll point out here, which ties in, with the authorizations I talked about earlier. Um, here we have a status for the file. And the status can be used to change the authorization. For example, I can have a file which only I am going to be able to see. Uh, it's my file. I, I, I added it to the database, and only I can see it. And then I can make it visible only to my team. And actually, this one is visible to the team, and everybody in my team can actually change the file. Um, or I can just say, hey, you can look at it, but you can change it. Or then again, all right. As, as soon as you have access to the database, you can, you can see my file. It's a public file. And that's one way we deal with authorizations. Um, right. Now, OK, quit. OK. Now, obviously, you, you're able to find, uh, to find your files that are in the database, but then you need able to add them. So I'm going to go into the, this. I'm just going to take a bunch of files from my uh, desktop, from my, from my uh, computer, and I'm going to drop them into my browser. So just a little bit of time so they can upload. It's actually pretty fast. OK. Once it's there, I can go on my list. And once again, um, you saw earlier, there you go. There's a bunch of different files, 3PDF, doc, XLS. Um, all of them are converted, so I get an image of them. 
Um, if I go to the doc file, that's the lorem ipsum file, if I get on the page, I actually get um, the preview of the doc file. This was actually done by converting it to a PDF because doc file will not open, obviously, in a browser unless you have a special uh, plugin. So without plugin, we actually convert that to a PDF so you can see it in the browser. This goes actually a bit further because um, if you take the Excel file, the Excel file, uh, let me just show you what the file actually looks like. This is just a file with um, different, uh, like this merge cells, this colors, um, there's two tabs. Um, and, and you can see the, the conversion into a PDF is, is actually pretty clean. Uh, you get the two pages with for the tabs, you get the colors, everything's fine. And you can actually go further than that if you want to show it on the web because you have an uh, HTML converter. And this does a pretty good job, actually. You even get the two tabs there. Um, so you get your, your file in the browser here again. You can change it because it's an HTML file, but you can actually see what's in there. OK, um, another basic function, like I told you, is the search. So I'm going to start by um, showing you. Obviously, we have an advanced search, which allows you to, like, you can uh, delete fi fields. Uh, search into any of the fields of the database. Um, once again, I said earlier, but the, the fields in the database are customizable. If you want to add, add some more, uh, change them, whatever, this is completely free. Uh, so uh, you can search for any word in, in this in this in the database. Um, I'm going to go into what most people actually use, which is what we like to call the Google search, which is basically one field. So if I'm going to uh, look into my database for ORDA, for example, and my file, obviously, um, there's highlights on, on the title, so it searches into the metadata, but it also searches into the uh, actual file, uh, the contents of the file, which was a PDF file to start with. And it gives me here in the page um, a highlight of one of the words it found. But we actually, go do, uh, we actually do go a bit further than that, because if you get onto the actual page, so it takes a little, uh, a little time, because now it's converting it to HTML, and then we work on the HTML to highlight the search word in the file. So here mm. you can see you get uh, all the highlighted, and you can just click on, the, on the, uh, every highlighted file, every highlighted word, and you'll get to see exactly what you search for in your actual PDF file. That's so nice. that makes it easier when you have like a 50 pages document to find what you're looking for without having to go through the whole 50 pages. Um, allow me to go back to the list real quick. Um, other basic functionalities of a search um, basically, you get filters. I've got just one result here, but basically you can uh, reduce your search, refine your search if you need to. Um, you can search to the, into your the results. Uh, there's also here, once again, only one file, but um, we also have some sort of intelligent uh, sorting, which is what we call the relevance here, where basically we return the results depending on where um, the search words were found. Like if it's at the beginning of the title, it's gonna be more, uh, it's gonna have more weight than if it's at the end of the contents. And once again, this is also customizable because depending on what fields you have in your database, you can change um, what fields, are, what the, the weight of every field. And you can even have like a, an, in, intri an intrinsic weight. So you can say, hey, every document that's recent is going to have uh, more weight than old documents. So I want them to show up uh, higher in the list of, of my results. And finally, so that users can easily find what they want, um, there's an option to save. Uh, your search. So I'm going to save my, my order search here as a can tap, which is what we call a can tap, which is uh, basically a widget that goes on my home page. And that way, whenever I log in, I'm going to have every document that's in the database that corresponds to my search on my home page. That means it's not just the documents I found today, but tomorrow somebody had a file uh, about order is going to show up in here. So I can um, just make sure I know everything that happens in the database. Uh, that works as well with uh, an advanced search. So you can, since you can search on any fields, you can really uh, customize your home page so you have all the information you need. Um, so that's that's basics uh, of what Kenska does for, for this application for, for, for EDM. Um, I'm going to show you uh, the API. So I've actually, I forgot to, uh, sorry, start the 4D. Okay, uh, let me open the database. So we, we've developed um, a 4D database, a really, really small database 
um, that allows you to test the API. Uh, there you go. So it's just basically the two uh, two uh, forms here. Um, so I'm gonna go back just a little really quick onto this architecture. Um, uh, okay, slide. So as I showed you, so now I've, I've showed you the basic functions of Kentica. So basically here we have Kentica. This is the main database. This is the web server, all in 4D. You can add, you can modify, you can delete your records with this. You can search the metadata. You can extract the preview for the PDF file. And this is Kentica does that. There's another, like I told you earlier, another software, the Kentica Document Engine. And this does the optical character recognition. It extracts the text and it does conversion of uh, files to PDF and HTML. And that's also what we use. Uh, it's, it's based on the Lucent technology for the uh, search. And that's what we use for the full text search, actually. So with your API, depending on what functionalities you need, you can either communicate directly with the Kentica Document Engine if you need just these functionalities, or you can communicate with Kentica if you want the whole deal. So I'm going to show you basically both of those, uh, those how, how both of these APIs work. Um, let me uh, start the form. All right. So for the converters, um, once again, this is REST API. So this is going to be JSON. So basically, uh, what this screen does is basically it builds uh, the object that you need to send to the software, and then it gets the answer. So I'm going to get file uh, converters. I'm going to take my Excel file that I used earlier. As you can see, the object that you send is pretty simple. You give it the input document, output document, and the format you want. Um, you can have, like I said, HTML, PDF, or text. I'm going to do text file because the other two I showed you earlier. And this is exactly, I, I showed you in the, in the Kentica, in the, in the portal. And that's exactly the way we do it, actually. This is, we use this, this same API to communicate with K, uh, Kentica Document Engine. So for the test, I'm going to send uh, the file. Um, and it's going to show me on the drive. And I get my, uh, my file converted to the text. This is useful if you need to do some work on it. This is what you use uh, to highlight uh, the results in, in the list to have an extract of the, what's been found in the list. And this is what we use also for the search. This is what we send to the uh, indexer, to the index, to the full text uh, the engine. Another functionality that's quite interesting is the, um, the OCR. Uh, I didn't show you how it works with Kentica. Uh, let me go and just find my PDF. There you go. This is a scan. There's, there's no text in this. It's all just an image. And with this, you can actually go take, check your file, PDF image. I'm going to send this to my uh, Kentica document engine, test it. It takes a bit longer because that's a little bit more work. Um, there's a, a button that appears when it's, once it's done. All right, come on. There you go, actually, it's getting there. Display, there you go. And now we got the PDF. And what's interesting with this is now you can actually search into your file and, and the, the words are actually found. So you can actually now search inside this file, which was initially just an image. Oh, that's great. All right. OK, so, and that, so that's what the Kentica Document Engine does. Um, the other API which this one's this now communicates with the, with the actual Kentica software. Um, so once again, we have different functions. So I'm going to show you really quick. Um, one thing about them, uh, obviously, you need you need to use a, an idea because, um, well, like I said, we have pretty strong authorization rules. So you can use whatever ID you want in the database. If you want to just get the data from one user, so only the data he he has access to you can you can use that um, here in this case I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna do the, ad, the admin I'm gonna get all the documents and then all the actual authorization rules are gonna be uh, done with my own uh, application uh, first thing you need I'm gonna start with the last tab here um, first thing you need is basically a description of the database for example here I'm gonna ask for uh, what's 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 up with the document table and I'm gonna get the list of all the fields that are in that table all the information about each of those fields. Um, like, for example, if I go to look at the status, uh, the status of the document, I get all the different uh, possible values with the codes. So this is what you can use to then communicate with the other functionalities. For example, if you want to do a search, um, I'm going to do basic search. 
like I want all the documents in the database. Basically, I'm going to ask for five of them because I don't want to have like 60,000 answers. Um, I'm just starting at one so you can have all the documents you want. And I'm just going to get that and I get my answer. I get my documents. Uh, and once again, this is JSON. So if you're working with 4D, very easy. You just do JSON parse and that's it. So you can work with those uh, from there. Um, another example, if you look for full text search, so here again, I'm going to look into the, the, the document table. Um, this is the code for the document table. This is the code for the field that's uh, full text. So I'm going to search in the actual file. Uh, that's what I'm going to look for, order again. Uh, you can also ask for just some fields. Like I, here, in, the, in this case, I, I had all the documents and there's like a bunch of fields. Some of them I'm not even going to need. So I'm going to ask for just the title and the comments. And I get here, I get my answer, my documents. Um, when I do that, I also get the relevance I showed you earlier. It's just a number, but basically you can use that if you want to sort the documents. Um, you get the title, obviously, which is what I've asked for. And then you get information about the file that's attached to the record. Now we are able to read the database again. Now if you want to add to the database. So here again, pretty simple uh, uh, structure for the query because you just give it like two documents. So in a table. Um, you give it an ID, you give it a title, and send that to the database. And Kentika gives you, okay, I've added those two documents. I'll get back to the screen a little bit later, but just to show you how it that it works. Um, I update my pages, and right there in, in the last updates, I've got my two documents. One important thing that that's to note here, um, we use the record ID, and Kentika gives us a record RN, which is actually a record, no record number. This is the internal, what we use internally as an ID, as a unique ID for the documents. But this doesn't mean anything for an outside application. So the record ID is actually your own application ID. So the, your, the ID for the document in your own application. Meaning now, if you want to change the document, um, you don't have to, re, to use Kentika's ID. You can use just your own. Like for example, if I take this, change the, I want to change the title. So I just give it the ID that I gave it already. And that Kentika tells me, hey, it's update because the document was already the database. So now I can see here, it's changed my title. And I don't have, you don't have to deal with Kentika's internal ID number if you don't want to. That's great for integration purposes. Yes, yeah. definitely. We know we've been on the other side of this. So that's why we actually added that. The, this option because it makes it a lot easier. Um, once you've created your record, you need to add the actual file to it. So once again, uh, this is actually pretty much the same um, uh, syntax for the query. Uh, let me see. Let's go for the doc. Um, so basically, once again, you send you send the information about the record. You send its ID. Um, I'm going to decide I want to change its title at the same time. I'm, I'm going to add a file. Um, so I give it the path. Now, obviously, if I give it the path, it means uh, your application is on the same uh, machine as the Kentika. But if it's not the case, you can just send, obviously, the base64 of the whole file. Um, you've got all the options here for the files, like to do the versioning, to replace the file, whatever. You can do all of those, all those, all of those things. Um, and then you send it to Kentika, and it gives you the answer again with an ID for the file, because uh, you can actually have several files on one record. So if I go into my actual file, uh, you can see the titles change. And when you send it to Kentika, uh, it's automatically converted to PDF, so it shows up in the in the in the website. And that's pretty much it, actually. Well, it's the last option if you want to delete your files. Obviously, you just send send the ID, send it, uh, and 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 your files are gonna be gone. If you go back to the home page. Uh, there you go. So, so that's basically it for the, for the API, actually. Um, and and yeah, right. Uh, just a couple more information about this. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, there's a documentation for this online. Um, it's available in English, obviously, and in French. Uh, you got everything I've been I showed you. Probably more than that, and you've got all the information about the syntax. Uh, for the API syntax to use, and if if you're interested in this uh, in this software, we can give you um, 
this database so you can test the API and we can give you to an, an access to an online uh, Kentica database as well so you can test both sides bo both sides of, of the of the communication oh that's great yeah I was just one of my questions I was going to ask is there a, a public uh, sandbox for for testing uh, working with the API and it appears there is not yet, but it will, oh. there will be very, very shortly. <laughs> okay, okay, and just um, and just to make sure it's uh, it's clear. Not not that anything you you said wasn't yeah. clear, but um, for for anyone that's uh, you know looking at the uh, the interface for the API testing database, you know this is this is basically what would be happening through the back end, uh, how the developers would integrate with Kantika. Uh, yes. And um, and essentially, uh, as as an end user, you could either directly use a uh, a stylized version of this web interface, or even uh, have it have it be uh, completely built from scratch, uh, only accessing uh, uh, Kantika through the API itself. Yes, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah completely. Either that's, that's yeah, exactly like you said. You can. Uh, so you can adjust your 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 own application in the front, and Kentica is completely invisible, invisible, or you can have both working in parallel. Um, so you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, and and how are the uh, the files stored on disk? I was just wondering. <laughs> it's a good question. They're actually uh, stored. There's a, a folder. Basically, we store them in a folder on the disk. Um, there's a Special uh, structure of the of the folder, so you can we can find the documents, and we don't end up with like ten thousand files in the same folder. Mm -hmm. But that's basically just stored on disk, actually. And uh, are those um, uh, uh, disk paths made available through the API? I'm sorry, the the files. Yes, yes. Um, I, I deleted my files, but when you ask for a file, you get a, a URL. Ah. So you can basically you can get the URL either directly to the to the to the file, this, to the to the website, I guess, or you can get the URL to the actual file, and then you can retrieve it. Ah, cool. Um, or or you get it directly on the disk. Um, um, actually, I'm not sure about that. I need to check that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, more often than not, you won't be on the same machine, right? Yeah, exactly. Just, just curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, should be. Uh, and what about uh, very large files? Well, there's no actual um, limit, like in, in, in the files. There, sh there will be, um, depending how you send them, uh, mostly because it goes through 4D that gets the data. So depending how much memory is available to 4D, um, your big files might be problematic. This is why, actually, we have the option I uh, showed you here on, on, on the file. Um, sorry, uh, let me just start that again, upload. Um, this is why you can send the file without uh, with a path, uh, get the file back. So I get the the JSON. Here you go. This is why you can give it the file path because if it's a very large file and you have trouble sending it over HTTP, um, maybe you can use another method. We've done that with FTP, for example. You can send the file file to through FTP to the ser to the Kentica server and then give it the path, give it the path uh, through there, and Kentica can use it and just copy paste without having to go through the memory. Yeah. Um, there's a, a question from the uh, from the chat here. When using uh, the term "big files," are we talking ten meg, yes. hundred meg, a gig? Yes, uh, we are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> depends, actually. It's, I, I, I would say it's more than one one gigabyte. I mean, ten megabytes, hundred megabytes should, shouldn't be too much trouble. Once again, it really depends how much memory is available to 4D, actually, mm -hmm. because if it goes to the cache uh, through a uh, through HTTP, it has to go through a uh, to the uh, 4D memory, so it's going to depend on how many, um, uh, um, or how big of a of a block of memory you have available in 4D when when you send the file. I see. Um, is there any uh, uh, chunking is, that's that's done uh, through the uh, the code for uh, in the file transfer, or is it uh, is it generally all or nothing? Uh... It's usually all or all or nothing actually at the mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and um, the I imagine uh, that that uh, your web interface um, 
uh, could also uh, be accessed, uh, you know, on, on a on a mobile device. Or have have you created any generic uh, iPhone apps or or other? Uh, we have not worked with an iPhone apps uh, app. Um, our interface works okay. This this interface works okay on a mobile, and we also have a special uh, mobile web interface mm -hmm. that's developed especially for for mobile. So it's uh, easy to uh, to find your files and, and find them in the in on your mobile phone. Yes, cool. It's a separate interface basically, but yes, the, the, we have one. Um, great. Uh, sorry, I, I jumped out, jumped in with a whole bunch of questions there. <laughs> um, uh, we have one more question from the chat. Uh, any chance you have linked to third party content delivery providers, uh, perhaps storage elsewhere, but access through uh, the Kantika? Well, um, the example that the person talks about video streaming, for example, this is actually a good question. Um, well, the, like I said, the database is completely um, open, so you can change the fields. So if you were to go through video streaming, you could actually uh, set up a, a streaming server somewhere. And then in Kantika, in your record, instead of so st storing a file, uh, you just create a field that's going to give you the link to the video. And then it can be integrated into the web browser. But you can, uh, but you can actually. Um, I mean, it, it, for, for the user, if you go through the browser, it, it's going to give you basically like the video is in Gantica, but the actual streaming is taken care of by a, 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 a streaming server. Cool. That, that answers the question. Um, how are the, uh, the backups commonly handled? So for the database, we use the 4D uh, backups, obviously. Um, and the, the disk, usually, it's, it goes to, uh, well, it depends how, how your servers are set up. We usually uh, do a backup of the, the disk, basically. Um, most of our clients, were for, for I guess, I want to say, like, smaller-ish bases, um, they're going to do, basically, a, a copy of the, of the server, like uh, uh, of, the, of the virtual ma machine, when it's, a, when it's a virtual machine. Sometimes they have uh, the store. The, so the, like I told you, the folder where all the, the files are stored, they actually put that on a on a, um, a network uh, drive, which has some special uh, backup capabilities, so they can uh, save that r regularly. Um, okay. Yeah, more more safely. Um, the uh, in the web interface, is it possible to uh, create sort of folders or collections of files? Yes. Uh, so we have actually, like I showed you here. Um, this, this is a, a special uh, setting we have for EDM, where basically you can deal, there, there's a structure here, a, a hierarchical structure, mm -hmm. which deals with teams. So teams are the ones who have the little like yellow uh, uh, people there. So you have a team, and in this, in this team, you can have folders. So you can create like, um, I can create a new folder, add my files to this. Um, I can take my file in here, put them into my folder. I can move it, uh, there you go. OK, I don't have the rights for that. Um, you can move the files around, um, and you can organize them the way you want. And all the actual access rights are dealt by uh, with the teams. So if I want to show only my teams are going to be able, my teammates are going to be able to see the files that are in my folder. But yeah, you can organize them this way, yeah. Cool. Um, are you able to use uh, the API when you don't, when, and, and this is a, um, a very specific question, but <laughs> <All right. laughs> again, uh, uh, perhaps guilty interest because we um, we have uh, a, you know we're we're interested in this kind of uh, uh, functionality here at the art institute at the museum. Um, but are you able to uh, sort of ingest a file when there is no file data whatsoever? If you're just saying I want to store a text value. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so, Sorry, I didn't understand that. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in the API, um, yeah. uh, are you able to to create a new entity in Kantika uh, by simply um, passing the text of the file itself instead of the binary uh, from the file? Well, uh, not well. It wouldn't be too difficult to to uh, not not by default, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't be too difficult to to do if it's mm -hmm. 
I mean, depending what you want to do, if you want to have it as a file, or you can just like have it in one of the fields of uh, your record. Right. This is two different. Uh, I guess there's two different notions. Like the, the record and the file is actually different. The record is a record in, in the 4D database. Basically, my uh, my 4D Write Pro tour is a record in the 4D database. Uh -huh. So I've got um, uh, metadata here, uh -huh. and then I've got an attached file, which is the actual file. So if you want to want to do to have a file, you can also use the. We have a, a special content uh, area where you can have like actual uh, HTML like enriched. Uh, you can have bold and colors and whatever. So you could, for example, send your uh, your text to, to this kind of of uh, a field, I guess. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And and and, and, and this, you save this, and the text actually uh, shows up on the record. So. Uh huh. Cool. Um. Great, yeah. Uh, let's see other questions. Uh, and any, anybody can jump in on the uh, on the YouTube page. Uh, you're able to uh, to post chat questions there or from within the Hangout. Let me show you a couple of uh, website uh, portals we've sure. done at the at the same time. Just uh, stop me if you. Oh yeah, questions. Pricing, good question. Uh, somebody asking about pricing. Um, so we have. Different, like I, I showed you, there's different uh, tools, I guess. So if you want just the, the converters, like the Kentica document engine, that's that's um, this block here. It's going to be around a thousand dollars. If you want the API here, the full Kentica, so it's actually uh, both of them too, with the basic website that's all preset, no real configuration. It's going to be around five five thousand. And then if you want the full deal with uh, everything we can do and customization and adding fields, removing them, changing everything, um, it starts at 10,000 and goes up depending on how much uh, time we're gonna, we're gonna spend on this. Uh-huh. Is that uh, euros or is that? Um... No, it's all dollars. Okay, dollars, great. Um, another question from the, the chat room here. What are your coding standards and best practices? Naming conventions. That's a that's a hard question, difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we I, I don't know that I can give you them like that. Um, basically, we've we've been especially since the software has been going for thirty years, so they have changed quite a bit. If you go into the older parts of the code, there's probably not that many of them. Um, it's, and we have we are a pretty small team at the moment. Uh, there's like two developers on this, so. We can make them as as we go, actually. Right. Now that's that's uh, as Ed mentioned um, uh, on the uh, on the nug. It's been a recent discussion about uh, uh, naming conventions and whatnot. I heard that, yeah. It's, yeah, it's always uh, it ends up being a a big uh, uh, argument or or yeah, a friendly discussion anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everyone has an opinion. Just like yes, other course. things, yeah. <laughs> the um, let's see. Uh, uh, Mike said, uh, as a developer, can I purchase and then customize it myself? Uh, I suppose you're talking about the code it itself, Mike, or or the um, the website. Uh, code for for a specific uh, client. Yeah. Code is locked, actually. Like I said, it's a compiled application, so mm -hmm. you, we don't give access to the code of of Kentica. Gotcha. That's, that's closed. I believe that's uh, that's um, yep, that's what we were getting at. Um, another question: Any advice for how to keep up with language changes, uh, especially with small teams supporting a large application? Well, I don't know if it's a good advice, but the way we do it, we do it, especially now, it's it's uh, it's pretty exciting. It's like you said earlier, what Ford is doing. Um, I, I've been in in Ford world, I guess, for six years, I think, um, and I've seen lots of changes because um, we started when I, when I joined. We were a bit lagging, a bit behind. Uh, we were at version version twelve, I think, Ford, oh. and now we see a lot of changes, and it's <clears throat> kind of hard. There's a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, Basically, the way we work is we, you can't change everything. Like 30 years of, of code, you can't go back to your code and change everything. So the way we work is when we are going getting back on a special function, and we, we have to 
to update things all the time because we're adding a little bit, we're adding a new a new functionality to something that worked fine before. And when we do that, we we uh, modernize the code at this point. And and that's the great thing about 4D and the great thing about what Orda is is <clears throat> about the way they are dealing with Orda. They're bringing like like uh, like Ed said, I think uh, a brand new way of coding. I mean, this is changing completely what we're doing. Um, but the way we we it's still compatible with everything that worked before. So you don't have to change your code right away. You can just integrate what's new as you work with it. Yeah, that's that's the wonderful thing with 4D, uh, given as uh, how long it's been around, how backwards compatible it is. Yeah, and even, even uh, Thomas Mao, who's uh, one of the, the head of uh, uh, 4D's uh, engineering team and, and um, I forget exactly what his his title is, but you know he to to give you an idea when he was uh, first revealing Orda to everyone, um, the question was asked, you know, should I should I reprogram everything in Orda? Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that as well. I've heard that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think um, the smartest approach is what uh, Alexander described, and what we do here at the museum is, uh, you know, if you if you know, I wouldn't change working code unless there's a, a very clear uh, benefit uh, from the performance or functionality. But otherwise, um, when you are forced to touch the code, uh, then, uh, then it's best to, uh, to go ahead and start, uh, you know, if possible, use the, the new features. Um, Noah also asked, uh, do you, in, your, uh, in, in the development of Kantika, and Kantika, um, the Kantika, Kantika API, do you have regression tests? Well, not, um, uh, uh, how's it called? Um, automated tests? Uh, how's that mm -hmm. called? The unit testing? Yeah, no, no, not, not, well, actually, it depends where. Sometimes we actually do a unit testing, but not that much. But we usually have, when, when it's touch a functionality, yeah, we try, we test everything that was. Uh, into that before uh, actually releasing the, releasing it. Great, yeah. I mean, that's that's a, again another uh, very important part of your uh, development strategy is to uh, to have these kind of tests and unit unit tests. At least um, uh, again, if if you don't have unit tests for certain parts of the application, uh, when you are forced to touch them. The, yep. the best first step sometimes is to write the unit test and develop to uh, to satisfy that those tests. So yeah, although unit tests are sometimes difficult to set up, especially like I said, a lot of the work we do has to do with the web interface, and with an interface, it's not that easy to uh, to create a unit test. Right. No, <laughs> but but given uh, the API approach. Uh, uh, yeah, for the API. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Good questions here. Um, I'll let you. I, kn I know you'd like to show a, a, a few. Um... It's, it's just a uh, mm -hmm. couple examples. Uh, I'm taking note. Uh, Noah uh, is um, suggesting Selenium for automated web tests. So I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, a couple of websites. So basically, the first thing is our website, our own uh, is uh, is actually made with Kantiga, actually. It's all, uh, all made. With, it's highly customized, <laughs> but still fully compatible with any updates. We don't have to take any special precautions to to just uh, uh, show uh, throw a new version at it. Uh, I'm just gonna just go ahead and ask a question if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if you have if I have like special uh, things to say, but just show you of like some of the portals. Um, yeah, we also do sometimes for some clients. We've been doing integrating uh, maps. So you can have your results on the search on, on an actual map. Cool. Right. So these are uh, customized web front ends. Uh, yeah, for some of our clients. Mm -hmm. I actually said uh, put that file together for uh, another customer who wanted to see what what we could do. So, so most of them are French. I think there's a couple examples or uh, from somewhere else. Is there a link to this file uh, on the Kantika um, website? Actually, no, not yet. Like I said, it was made for a customer. Mm -hmm. I had to change it a little bit because some of those things were not uh, public, really. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So. Because uh, this is uh, really a fantastic review of, uh, you know, I'm sure people can imagine uh, some of these pages with their own company 
uh, identification feel, on yeah, them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also it's not just the, the general uh, feel of the of the web. It's also like the options, the way you can you approach the web. Like the first page, there are some of them are, are like this one. There's a lot of information in there. Um, some of them I, I showed earlier. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish this and. Um, like so some of them have more an approach like just images like very very uh, little text uh it really depends like this one big icons it really depends on, on on the way your customers work actually um like i talked earlier about our clients like lawyers a uh, lawyer is like a lot of text usually <laughs> not that many pictures um depends on who they are like in the arts uh this was one for the school dance or whatever in the arts they like uh, a lot more pictures and a lot less text so it really depends Depends what you want. Um, we try to make it so that the end users actually have what they need right from the front page. When you when you work on a website, you have to think a lot about the number of clicks to get to uh, to any any uh, function. So the things that are getting used every day, you need to be able to have to access them with like zero or, or, or one click maximum. And and that's sometimes that's a lot of selection to to figure out okay what's what is really important. Because you can't mm. put everything on the front page, so right it has to be, to be a lot of thought about that. Right. Well, that's um, no, it's great to see <clears throat> how flexible uh, Kantika is uh, as far as um, putting a different face on it and integration into uh, into your 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 own web style and yeah. access. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, would you like to cover anything else, or uh, I think we um, just I guess one last thing I guess. Okay, there you go. <laughs> ah, just great. The links. <laughs> um, okay. That's our website. Um, second second link is the web the link to the um, the API documentation I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. and then obviously my email address. If anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Absolutely. Um, again, this is a, uh, a really tremendous capacity that could be added to uh, any of your uh, any, any of the 4D applications out there. <clears throat> and um, uh, I guess I, one quick question yeah, um, for you know install uh, end to end install into a, a customer with a customer. Um, what what kind of uh, time scale? uh like how how far out can you schedule these kind of things and how long do they take like depending on, um from like first contact to uh to live sure you know, why not because it actually is going to depend a lot on on what you want um right uh if you want like i said this 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 portal this preset of kentica it can be really fast i mean this is 4d so you know the, the installation and, and the actual technical part is really short so it really depends how much how much um, customization you need. Mm -hmm. if, if if you want this this, like I said, this portal installed on the server, we have access to a server, whatever. I'm guessing in two weeks we can have it ready. Um, wow, obviously, great. if there's talks about customizing, there's a lot more talk going on. What do you need? How can we do that the best? And, and there's a lot more talk going on. Usually, project it depends. Also, I mean, we um, let me think about that. For projects, we usually take like depends a uh, month six months maximum i think for big projects uh, okay. the ones that are really slow and people don't get back to you can right. take six months <laughs> yeah. but usually not it's a, a lot shorter than that yeah it's not always up to uh can yeah, exactly I'm sure exactly. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's um no that's neat uh to uh to consider that again uh guilty interest as uh you know yeah. we're lo looking at um these kind of capabilities here at the museum so Okay, let me just check uh, one more time um, out at the, uh, the chat rooms here. Um, switch back to uh, the <laughs> picture. <laughs> and Noah says, great presentation. I would say the same. Very impressive functionality. I would say the same. Um, and thanks so much for, uh, for, for showing off the application. Again, I can uh, I can really think of a few things that uh, that I could do with this type of API at my disposal, um, but yeah. So thank you, thank you so much to uh, to Alexander uh, and everyone at uh, at Kantika for uh, for for putting together this material and for showing off the capabilities there. Um, uh, again, with 4D method, um, 
our schedule is available on the website at 40method.com slash schedule. Uh, our next meeting dates are March 13th, May 8th, and July 3rd. If you're available to show off some of your applications or uh, uh, code that you've been writing or uh, have something interesting you'd like to share, uh, uh, contact 40method at, at gmail.com and we'll try and get you on the schedule. Um, uh, otherwise, any other questions and discussion? Uh, it's still a little bit of time for that. Any feedback is appreciated, good or bad. Um, and uh, and if you found some value to uh, this 40 method meeting and, and recording uh, uh, or any of the other ones, uh, feel free to support the user group on Patreon at the link patreon.com slash 40 method. So thank you to 4D, uh, everyone at 4D, and to Alexander and Kantika and Ed, and Ed, to everyone who joined the, the Hangout. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Alexander. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Alexander. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Ed. Great okay. presentation. Great presentation. OK. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you at 40 Method. So OK. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.